Well, um, so first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers of the conference for inviting me. Uh, my name is Jordan Hansen. I'm an assistant professor of physics and computer science uh, at Whittier College. And this work is brought to you in part by Whittier College, the Office of Naval Research, and the Ice Cube Generation 2 uh, collaboration. So this is broadband RF phased array design with MEEP. So my lecture is essentially four stories. Uh, and the first one, the background is actually quite interesting here because it's like, how did I even encounter MEEP as a tool? Uh, and then we'll talk about what are uh, broadband RF phased arrays. Uh, and one example of an application of uh, RF phased arrays in a really unique uh, environment where the index of refraction in which that object is embedded is, uh, is not a constant. Um, and that happens to be Antarctic ice. Uh, and then we'll uh, conclude with progress in RF antenna design uh, facilitated by me. So um, since I'm the last speaker of the day and I'm sure everyone's tired, let me start with a, uh, a little story uh, to wake everyone up. Imagine that a little uh, boy uh, goes into the garage looking for a hammer and he encounters what he thinks is a bag of hammers, pulls one out uh, and you know gathers a little project and starts tapping away, tap, tap, tap. Dad comes in son, what are you doing with my golf clubs? And the kid turns to his father and says, what's golf? That's kind of how I feel about me. Like I, I'm someone who's using a golf club like a hammer. Like I just, I, it works and we'll uh, see how far we can take it. So I give the, the subtitle from microns to centimeters. This is an application of computational electromagnetism in uh, research with IceCube and the Office of Naval Research. So uh, first of all, uh, let me say a little bit about Whittier College. Uh, we are a four-year liberal arts college located in Southern California, halfway between downtown Los Angeles and Anaheim, California. So this is the historic East Los Angeles area, which um, you know, since hundreds of years ago used to be part of Mexico. And so most people around here speak both Spanish and English, and we have a special mission at Whittier College to provide access to you know, cutting edge research and higher education in physics, astronomy, computer science, and mathematics uh, to uh, historically underrepresented populations. Uh, and so we have a special classification from the federal government for that. Uh, my research takes place in uh, uh, computational electromagnetism, uh, something called the Iscarian effect, which is related to ultra high energy neutrino detection. Uh, and, and one of the tools we use to, to detect those neutrinos is a RF phased array. Um, so I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, and so as you can imagine, RF antenna design and fabrication, Antarctic ice properties and drones, these are things that all wrap together uh, under some uh, unique uh, package. Um, so I'm more of a person who deals with uh, centimeter wavelengths. Uh, and and uh, I feel like I'm you know, approaching a new club and everyone is, is more involved with the uh, micrometer uh, wavelength uh, stuff, and it's all been very sophisticated, and I've been furiously taking notes uh, and saving papers, and I really appreciate the uh, the invitation. So what is IceCube? Uh, IceCube is the world's largest neutrino detector, and Whittier College uh, is a member institution. So IceCube uh, is located at the South Pole because we need ice as, an, as a detection medium, as it turns out. Uh, and that where is all the ice? We need lots and lots of ice, like cubic kilometers of ice. So it's not something that you can just make in the, a building somewhere. Uh, and so we just go to Antarctica. Um, Antarctic ice has um, high quality uh, optical transmiss transmissivity. So the photons generated, uh, Trinkoff photons generated by ultra high energy neutrinos and other particles, they propagate for uh, you know, almost 100 meters uh, before they're absorbed or scattered. And so Ice Cube is essentially a lattice of optical sensors that's buried beneath the South Pole. Um, so in the lower right-hand side, you see a figure uh, that explains the size and scale uh, with the Eiffel Tower for comparison. Uh, and so imagine that an ultra high energy neutrino uh, comes in from outside the, the galaxy and, and enters the solar system to the Earth, hits the Earth's crust. Well, nothing really interesting happens there, except if it hits something where the actual Trinkoff photons can propagate to a sensor. And so such a material with an index of refraction uh, like ice is convenient because of its transparency. Uh, Trinkoff light is happens, it's like the same kind of thing when you turn on a nuclear reactor, you see that blue glow, it's charged particles that are moving at the speed of light or faster than the speed of light 
in the medium, so faster than C divided by N, where N is, is the index of refraction. And so you get this, this optical effect that can be detected. Um, however, uh, there are those of us who are working on expanding Ice Cube to generation two, where uh, we seek to utilize something called the Iscarian effect. So the Iscarian effect is when ultra high energy neutrino events uh, generate a cascade of charged particles, just like when they would generate the optical Trinkoff light. Uh, but those char charges, they radiate collectively in the RF bandwidth. So that's the second way you might detect these things. And Ice Cube has detected neutrinos up to 10 to the 15 electron volts, 10 to the 15th power electron volts. Uh, and that's a world record, um, but the, uh, in terms of the energy, but the, um, what's interesting about radio waves is they propagate for like kilometers in ice. Um, so I and others have characterized the, the radio frequency properties of, of Antarctic and Greenlandic ice and shown that, it, that at least for a kilometer, you have at most radio frequencies uh, uh, propagation sufficient to do this detection. Um, so there are a host, there are several um, you know, diagrams here depicting uh, various prototype experiments that have been deployed over the years to try and pull off uh, a detection of an ultra high energy neutrino with via the Iscarian effect. And the reason it's interesting is because there's no reason to expect that higher and higher energy neutrinos uh, don't exist. And so, but they're more rare according to the spectrum, the energy spectrum of the flux. So uh, it, the rarer it is, you just need a bigger volume of ice, but you don't want to uh, put, you know, densely packed optical sensors for miles and miles and miles, that would be prohibitively expensive and, and technically too challenging. But imagine absorbing, uh, observing um, a giant block of ice with a single, you know, little radio detector. Um, and so it would greatly expand the sensitivity and the energy range of the world's largest neutrino detector. And in particular, the Ariana experiment, that's an, a long acronym that I won't, I won't go into it, but um, it's already done this for cosmic rays. So cosmic rays um, also extend up to 10 to the 15, 16, 17 electron volts and energy. And in this case, you can think of it as a proton hitting the Earth's atmosphere and illuminating like a small town size area of ice with a radio pulse. So Antarctica is nice because in addition to having high quality ice for the potential neutrino candidates, it also has uh, almost no radio backgrounds because there's no people. So um, we've discovered that RF phase arrays uh, are an excellent tool for doing the NIS detection uh, because they enhance signal, they enhance, they enhance the signal to noise ratio. Uh, so what is an RF phase array? It's essentially a line of antennas working together. And if you add the signals coherently, uh, you get an enhancement. So yeah, like in the upper left-hand figure, this is a figure I'll go over once more, but it's essentially a line of antennas on the y-axis that can radiate, for example, in the x direction. Uh, or receive, and you have to add up the signals in the right way. Um, so I came to this, I came to discover MEEP because I was also working for the Office of Naval Research, and I saw someone uh, reference the Office of Naval Research on one of their slides before as a, uh, as a partner institution. I thought that was kind of cool. So um, we uh, were interested in phased arrays for a variety of reasons, telemetry, targeting, tracking, GPS modernization, and uh, in particular, uh, you can imagine that if you had a system where it's meant to radiate um, a line of antennas, you can just give each, each of them a different phase. Uh, that allows you to build a radar beam that you can steer, right? The beam angle is somehow related to the phase shifts you give all of your, your little antenna elements. And so that's known as an active electronic scanned antenna system or an ASEA. Uh, and as you can imagine, building a radar system that has no moving parts is highly useful for the object pictured in the bottom right, F35 Raptor. Uh, so I'll use uh, a concept called the radiation pattern, normalized radiation pattern. Uh, I took this figure from Introduction to Airborne Radar by Stemson. Uh, the yellow figure shows in the middle part, it shows a two-dimensional radiation pattern, which is uh, essentially the normalized radiated power to zero decibels. Um, so in the main uh, direction, you know, it, you call that zero dB, and as you go to the right or to the left, or in this case, as you as you change the azimuthal angle, the power is reduced to let's say minus three dB on either side, and that forms a width that you call the the beam width. Now, um, that's a two-dimensional um, projection of what it really is, uh, and then and in the bottom left is the, th the full three-dimensional case where it's you know it's it, it describing all the degrees of freedom of of the of the pattern. So what I've done here 
is uh, I've given some links. This is for later, so people can can go back and research like how how are these things tied together. Um, I've got the radio detector prototypes, IceQ, Whittier College, ONR, and uh, the specific division of Office of Naval Research with whom I um, have this. I share this work. So. Um, so one of the things I really appreciated about MEEP was the documentation. So I want to say that over and over again, I really appreciate whoever maintains the, the MEEP read the docs um, and the fact that it's free and open source. Uh, because at Whittier College, we are a primarily undergraduate institution. We don't have the resources to purchase what uh, typical RF engineers purchased, which is proprietary software to design high frequent, like, you know, um, 5G level uh, antennas in the you know five to ten gigahertz range, um, you know those things can run to ten thousand dollars, and uh, we just can't do that. So I started uh, when they asked me to research uh, designing RF phased arrays. Is there an open source software tool that I can use to uh, to design RF antennas? Um, I had worked with others in the past where someone else, like my PhD advisor or a postdoctoral fellowship advisors, had purchased them, but I needed an open source tool and I needed one quickly. Um, so I encountered this uh, this um, review article uh, by Alessandro Fedeli et al. Uh, in an electronics journal. This is an open access journal uh, via MDPI entitled Open Source Software for uh, Electromagnetic Scattering Simulation, the Case of Antenna Design. And they went through uh, many choices that RF engineers typically choose in the open source world, but they each have their own special like applications. So there's the classic NEC family of codes, numerical electromagnetic code. Uh, the ground penetrating radar community has GPR max. There's one called open EMS and then MEEP as the it was the first finite time difference uh, uh, sample or example mentioned, um, but they didn't use it in their their analysis comparisons of these different codes, but they did mention that it was written in Python. That's all I needed to hear. So they gave they gave a special figure at the bottom left, um, a kind of explaining the design flow or design process for uh, RF antennas. And in our paper, we simply updated that to include uh, steps that you have to take to do these things in MEEP. Uh, and so then uh, in 2021, we published uh, RF, broadband RF phased array design with MEEP. Uh, and that was in the same journal, Electronics Journal. It's an open, open access journal. And that was important for me because uh, most of my students, well, our college can't um, secure access to every IEEE journal. So uh, by doing it this way, our students can access it anywhere, they, wherever they are. Um, and this paper uh, won top 10 most notable articles honors for six months in a row. And I was uh, emailed by people from, I think it's up to five countries now asking me for my code or how, explain me how you did this. Um, and I had no idea uh, that people were were hungry for this. And I thought um, it was really interesting that I had stumbled upon something that was so uh, unique. And I just thought it was just out of pure necessity that I needed this. Um, so when you typically design an, an antenna, you start with some pick, like the forward design way of doing it is you typically pick uh, some classical example of an antenna and you're just gonna modify the shape the um, in like a continuous way. Um, and so once you define your element geometry, um, I chose to um, essentially break it into Legos or segment it into many little MEEP objects that were circles and cylinders and things like this, um, you know, rectangular pr geometric objects. Um, and I wasn't yet ready to use CAD design um, to, to include that with my MEEP uh, uh, computations. But once we did that, um, we defined, you know, near to far uh, surfaces or near to far regions for near to far projection. Uh, we decided what kind of array to do. So you can do a one dimensional array, like a row of antennas, uh, or you can do a grid of antennas and I call that a two dimensional array. Uh, and then you have to decide if you're gonna do single frequency antennas or broadband and also uh, how, what's your inter element spacing. So if you see, um, you know, in this diagram, there's a dy parameter in the upper left, like how close are your antenna is going to be. Um, that deter that's actually a very important parameter. Uh, and so then you run the, the simulation, you do the near to far field projection, and then actually in this case, you can compare uh, to exact predictions from RF uh, antenna theory. And it turns out that MEEP um, provides a, a near to far field uh, tutorial. So once again, thank you so much for the, the wonderful documentation. And, and it matches antenna theory exactly. And I was really um, surprised by that. And it was a very much of a delight. Um, so this figure, um, let me just cover the, the interesting or the important uh, physical 
uh, parameters in this picture, all the antennas are polarized linearly. Um, and that's going to be true for the for the duration of my my work here. Uh, and then there are 16 of them, so I label them with an integer. So the capital N is the total number of them. Uh, they're all linearly polarized in the y direction. They're radiating at least initially in the x direction, unless they have different phases. Uh, so let delta little phi be the azimuthal beam angle. That, so if you're you know, deviating from zero degrees, then you've got some delta little phi. Uh, let delta capital phi be the phase shift per element. So um, I know that's clunky notation because they're both phi, but actually it turns out they're they're pretty much the same thing. They're they're linearly proportional. So if I give antenna number one zero degrees and then antenna two 10 degrees, antenna three 20 degrees, then that's a delta phi of 10, 10, 10, 10. And that corresponds to a single beam angle. So the radiation pattern is directed, you know, for a given uh, delta little phi. Uh, let lambda be the wavelength and then dy is the inter element spacing. So here's some a little bit of phased array theory, two two theorems, and maybe these things look familiar um, because again, I'm I'm just someone using a golf club like a hammer. Um, you guys, I think, probably know a lot more than uh, than I do about about this sort of thing. Um, but it turns out in equation one, you can show that the beam angle is li linearly proportional to the to the the phase shift per element, and the the constant proportionality or the slope. Uh, is just the ratio of lambda, lambda divided by the inter-element spacing. Uh, so typically what you want in a phased array is um, a high slope. You want lambda to be much larger than inter-element spacing so that a little bit of change in delta phi, capital phi on the right-hand side, gives you a big change in phi on the left-hand side. Um, the problem there is that the beam width is also proportional to lambda, so um, you don't always win. If you do that, if you just increase your lambda, uh, sometimes you know you'll get a lot of steering, but the beam is so fat that it doesn't matter. Um, so there's a trade-off there that has to be optimized. Now the radiation pattern, there's actually a an analytical expression for the radiation pattern if you know the, the kind of uh, phased array you're doing. So let P, capital P, be the normalized radiation pattern or power versus azimuthal angle in this case. So I'm doing, I'm imagining here that phi literally is the azimuthal angle and P is normalized power radiated at that angle. Um, and you can show that it's this complicated expression. Um, phi, zero, phi sub zero is the reference angle. So whenever you have no phase shift per element, then it's going to radiate at some angle. We'll call that phi zero. That's typically that's typically zero degrees for me. But you don't want to assume. Um, and then uh, a little corollary of equation two is you can predict the beam width. And it, you, what you get is that it's some numerical constant times. The, the wavelength, so it's the beam width is actually inversely proportional to frequency. Uh, for most RF engineers, that's a really common uh, bit of knowledge that the, the higher the frequency you go, the narrower your, your um, beam pattern is. Uh, but it's also inversely proportional to capital N, or L is actually capital N times D phi, or D, um, dy. So it's the total like lateral length uh, from left to right of the, the phased array. So the um, so those those properties are going to be elucidated as I as I run the MEEP computations, and I'll show that those are the those are things are actually going on. So um, so here are my MEEP diagrams. Uh, these these comp computations are just for one dimensional phased arrays, uh, and and I do them in two dimensions at first plus time. So I chose two kinds of uh, elements. I chose Yagi Uda style elements, which are just like like the television antennas I see on every, top of everyone's house and apartment building here. Um, they're just collections of dipoles with a common spine, and then one dipole, the, the red one, is responsible for doing the radiating, and the other elements are shaping and guiding the, the, the radiation. Uh, the blue surfaces are near-to-far regions for near-to-far projection. The green are PML, perfectly matched layers. Uh, and there are 16 sources with 16 um, individual elements for a one-dimensional phased array. Uh, on the right, oh, and by the way, once again, these units are meant to, you're meant to think of these units in centimeters, okay, but, uh, um, but you know, if you're used to dealing in, in microns, uh, once again, hammer and, and golf. So um, the, the, on the right-hand side, you see the broadband uh, version of my two-dimensional antennas. These are called RF horns, um, and the shape there is just an exponential. It's like a positive going exponential and a negative going one, and there's an actual function I use to describe that, and I just put a little a little square um, according to the center location of that function and build the, the horns that way. Uh, notice you can only get them so close because um, the, 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 the low wavelength likes that, that you know, uh, large mouth and then the high frequency 
um, the long wavelength likes the end of it and the, the short wavelength likes the back of it. So, um, so in that way, it's, it's sensitive to radiating or receiving in, in a broadband sense, but, but then that means you can't, there's some fundamental limit on how small you can make dy the, the separation. Okay. The, oh, and by the way, when you express the two-dimensional radiation pattern in just the xy plane in this case, that's called the e plane. These are all uh, y polarized. They're all polarized in the y direction, all my sources. Um, and then the h plane would be the, the xz plane, xz, um, but there is no h plane for a purely two-dimensional calculation. Um, so I'll breeze past this table pretty quickly. This is just to show you that in the paper we we provide the, the parameters so that these results should be repeatable. Um, but there's, and it's describing exactly how you build the, the horns in the Yagi Uda antennas. Um, I'm going to normalize my radiation patterns to the beam angle, like power, so they're always going to be maximum at zero decibels. But there's something that you have to know about, about phased arrays when you scan them as far to the left or as far to the right as you possibly can. Eventually, um, you can't do that anymore. And that's because there's, there's something called scan loss. And so I found from my broadband case uh, that if I tune my frequency all the way down to half a gigahertz, uh, and then steered as far to the side as I possibly could by introducing a phase shift per element of 80 degrees, um, the ratio of dy to lambda happens to be um, 0.125 there, that I finally thought encountered scan loss of about negative 12 decibels. So there is some, some limit to how, how wide of a field of view you have. Um, but, but above that, it's, it's, it's less than a decibel. So you can um, rest assured that when I normalize my radiation patterns that I'm essentially telling the truth. Um, so my first set of results for the 1D array, uh, that, that, so for both the single frequency Yagi Uda style and then the broadband are shown here. Uh, in the upper left, there's a figure where it's the, the Y axis is the beam angle uh, divided by the beam width. So that's a unitless parameter. Uh, and then on the X axis is the phase shift per element in degrees. Uh, and so the squares are the data that I get when I run MEEP. Uh, and then the black line is a linear uh, regression fit to those to those data. The gray line is the theoretical expectation, and you can see there's a really good match. Um, the uh, right, and by the way, that's just for n equals eight one-dimensional Yagi. So those are that's like eight Yagi's in a row. The upper right-hand figure is the exact same, but it's n equals 16. So the the beam width is shrunk by a factor of two. So you get more steering for more antennas, uh, but you should still expect a a linear fit. Uh, and so, uh, and, and the uh, linear relationship between delta capital phi and delta little phi. Now, uh, lower left, uh, beam width of the n equals 16 horn array uh, versus frequency should be go as one over f, albeit there's a there's a, a little complication which I have to add a constant because I'm dealing with finite number of antennas, so you're not going to get a beam width of zero ever. Uh, but it, the fund functional dependence on frequency should be a 1 over f frequency, uh, frequency dependence. And so I do fit a 1 over f uh, function, and, and, it, and it, I mean a 1 over frequency function, and it fits the data uh, very well. Uh, and again, that's for horns, and I'm varying um, from half a gigahertz to like, you know, three gigahertz there. Uh, and you get the same relationship for the horn array, so I'm plotting it just as in degrees versus phase shift degrees. So the beam angle is on the y-axis in degrees, and then the phase shift per elements on the x-axis. And you get the same linear relationships, but they're, but it's a different slope for different frequencies, but you still, you still get a linear relationship. So here are my... Um, you know, array patterns. And so the, uh, you know, I'll just kind of go through these quickly, but the, the blue is the MEEP results. And then the, the red is equation two, the, the theoretical prediction for the, the, the array, um, the, the array pattern, the beam pattern. But the, the, you, you notice that there's a symmetry in the red curve, which the theory, and then the MEEP results are in blue and they don't match on one side. But if you go back to this formula, uh, equation two is for a row of point sources, and so it actually radiates in both directions equally. Uh, and so the the red curve should, if you just concentrate on the upper uh, left figure, uh, that should be for, um, you know, that's a row of point sources, so it, it, it radiates in 180 degrees and zero degrees to get them simultaneously. Uh, but the whole point of having elements instead of point sources is that they direct the they have a directivity. They direct the radiation in, in the forward direction. And you typically want 
uh, minus 15 decibels of backward suppression. So the front to back ratio should be at least minus 15 dB, uh, if not more. Now notice as I uh, change my phase shift per element, uh, then uh, that you go from upper left to bottom right, the beam steers. Um, and also my uh, side lobes, my back lobes and side lobes are in the right locations. In some cases, they're actually even the right power, um, which is really interesting. This is for a higher frequency at five gigahertz, but it's the same style uh, plot. So you can see again, there's a good match for the main lobe. Um, so here's the 1D horn array at half a gigahertz. So this is the very, very lowest um, I can go with that, with that style of antenna. Um, again, you get a match uh, uh, in the side lobes, main lobes, steering, uh, but also uh, you see that the back, backward, forward backward ratio is much, much better for the, the horn. There's almost no backward uh, radiation. That's actually arguably the point of a horn is that it has really high directivity for, uh, for, for a broad range of frequencies. Um, so for five gigahertz, now the theory goes crazy and I'll explain what those are in a moment, although you might know, know them by a different name. Uh, but first, let me just point out that the the main lobe is still matching the the direction and 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 magnitude and shape of the the theoretical uh, lobe. Um, now there are these two, there are these six side lobes in the theory and two side lobes in the the MEEP results. Um, those are called grading lobes um, in RF parlance. So the grading lobes are there because there's a phase ambiguity. Are we going this way or that way? And it happens because the wavelength is now too small compared to dy. So that ratio is really important, and if it gets too, um, if it if it gets too big, if if lambda is is much smaller than dy, then then all of a sudden grading lobes appear theoretically. But what's going on here is that the horn is suppressing them because of its shape. So there's something called the pattern multiplication theorem, which says you take the the red curves, the theory for the row of point sources, and multiply it by the array pattern for the individual elements, and the product of those things is actually the the computational uh, array pattern. Here's what the fields look like. Um, I don't want to run out of time, so I'll, I'll just kind of show that uh, we do visualize the fields. This is the 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 Y component of the field uh, plotted in uh, the positive uh, values are pink and the blue values are, are the negatives. Uh, the corresponding array, uh, the corresponding uh, radiation pattern is on the right. It's nine degrees away from from forward uh, foresight. Uh, and then this area is 80 by 150. Uh, centimeters with a resolution of only six, but because of the long wavelength, it turns out that's 70, 72 pixels per uh, per wavelength. So you can interpret the individual little features. You can also see where the back lobe comes from as the radiation turns around the the um, the uppermost and the bottommost antennas. Uh, RF engineers usually get rid of that by inserting a back plane. By the way, I should say that I really am in the far field. When I get the radiation patterns, I do near to far projection out to 10 meters. Um, so I'm interpreting the units here to be centimeters. So I take that to 1,000 centimeters. Um, so how do you update these two uh, theorems for two-dimensional phased arrays? It's really simple. You just account for, like if I have a grid of antennas here um, in the, the uh, ZY plane, and I'm going to radiate in, in potentially in the X direction, which is into the into the page, right-hand rule. Um, so the it's the phase shift per row and the phase shift per column that ends up mattering. Also, the 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 um, uh, now the H plane. If my if I'm polarizing and still in Y, the E plane is the X Y plane. Now the X Z plane is called the H plane uh, radiation pattern. Uh, those two radiation patterns like can be obtained by factoring the the overall radiation pattern. So there's a separate you know E plane H plane pattern. Um, right, that's all I want to say about that. Uh, I did have to modify the the um, the two dimensional horn needed to be modified due to memory constraints because this was all taking place during lockdown with my one year old on my lap, and I had just a laptop. That was it. So I had eight cores and sixteen gigabytes of RAM. What can you do, right? And so I just figured out that if I reduce my uh, n by n, so if I just do eight horns by eight horns, and I kind of modify the shape a little bit um, to use less MEEP objects, then I can fit that on the laptop. Um, but I didn't have to modify the Yagi's at all. I also had to insert a backplane for the eight by eight horns just to get rid of some of the backward radiation. 
so these are the same kind of linear relationships for, for, for beam angle versus phase shift per row and column. Um, and the black line isn't even a fit anymore. It's just a theoretical expectation. Um, so I get the correct steering um, in E and H plane. On the right hand side, I just show you one quarter of all the resolvable locations where I give the error bars as the, the beam width. This is a 16 by 16 Yagi Uda at five gigahertz. So uh, if I gave, if I did all the positive uh, phase shift per uh, per L per row and column, you'd get you'd get also this like 36 times four uh, uh, points that you can resolve in the uh, forward direction. Also, the it's important to mention the dy, the separation in in the y axis is the same as dz, even though the horns are have an asymmetry. You'll see what they look like in three dimensions in a moment. Um, same results for the n by n equals eight by eight horn array. This is at one gigahertz, um, and you get the again you get the correct steering. So the the, the data points agree with the theoretical prediction there. Um, I just chose the location of zero phase to be different on the grid, so you get a positive uh, shift in beam angle versus positive uh, phase shift per row and column, um, and that's just a, a choice that you can make in the in the code. Um, you also get the fact that the E plane beam width and the H plane beam width are, are both going as one over the frequency, uh, which is which is still the case. That's still what the antenna theory predicts. Um, and then uh, you got radiation patterns. So in the, uh, the the upper row, you see all the E planes, and in the bottom row, you see all the H planes. The left hand figures are for three gigahertz, four gigahertz on the right hand side, six figures E and H plane. Uh, and so again, you get wonderful agreement between MEEP and and the uh, the theoretical prediction, albeit we're not we're, we're actually suppressing the backward lobe. Um, finally, I get some disagreement between MEEP and the antenna theory when I go to the eight by eight three dimensional horn structure. Um, so on the left hand side, it's half gigahertz. Right hand side is one gigahertz, so it's narrower uh, in beam width. But then. Uh, and the upper row is the E plane and the bottom row is the H plane. Uh, and then it's the side lobes now that, that don't agree anymore with the theory, mo mostly because I'm inserting a back plane to suppress backward radiation, because I want to stay below. It's a kind of a requirement when we do these things for ice cube and ONR that you need at least a, a minus 15 uh, decibel um, reduction in the backward direction. So one uh, application for uh, ice cube is that we can use a fa linear phase array in one dimension with dipoles or, or yagis or horns or whatever uh, as a detection mechanism or detection trigger for uh, ultra high energy neutrinos. And the way the reason we need that is because um, we need a we need a really really sensitive uh, trigger to low signal to noise ratio RF pulses, and that tells the rest of the detector when to turn on and record uh, RF channels and that could potentially be recording noise for no reason. So um, so there are, there's a group of us that have studied the properties of Antarctic ice. Uh, we have, we think, a good model that's derivable from first principles and agrees with the data for the index of refraction versus depth in the ice. Um, this is what the data looks like. It's just, uh, it's exponentially approaching the solid ice predicted value for, for um, the radio bandwidth. Uh, but there's some decay that takes some time for nature to compact the, the snow uh, down into solid ice. Uh, and so there's an effect called shadowing because if the medium doesn't have a, a constant index of refraction, then radio waves won't travel in straight lines anymore. They bend. Uh, and if the neutrino hits in the wrong place, the, the signal is actually bent away from the detector before it actually reaches the, the phased array. So that's um, something that we'd like to understand. Um, so I use MEEP for that as well. So I embedded uh, a one-dimensional phased array in radiation mode, not receiving mode, but it's just to illuminate the shadowing effect there. Um, at different depths on the, on the figure 19, it's just an n equals eight one-dimensional phased array. And I turn it on and sure enough, you get the, the bending. Uh, according to the ice model, you get the right bending. Uh, the side lobes actually illuminate the shadow zone. And then MEEP also gets correctly the fact that the, the side lobes refract into the air and then travel straight. And there are actually groups of physicists who fly be balloons that are meant to hear uh, that, that radiation from a potential neutrino interacting in the ice. Um, so you get you know things like total internal reflection, uh, bouncing off the surface, refracting to the to the sky, so cases A, B, C, and D uh, are all present in the the meat calculation. Um, I'd like to end. I don't want to run over time. I'd like to end with making and actually fabricating these antennas that 
uh, will hopefully uh, you know, create a, a complete cycle that's fully open source, facilitated by MEEP uh, for RF antenna design and fabrication. So um, it turns out that MEEP is uh, capable of GDS2 import with something called K-Layout. And so we've learned how to do CAD design and get into the K-Layout into MEEP, perform the calculations we need, and then from K-Layout generate an STL file to a 3D printer. Uh, so the, the idea is to form a complete open source cycle, uh, which will allow us to create the antennas that we need on in mass uh, without having to do any expensive machine tooling or or buy expensive proprietary software. Uh, and so I'll do something like predicting antenna efficiency uh, and then and then talk a little bit about 3D printing of final products. So I showed this before uh, just a moment ago, but it, we start with a functional uh, specification in our brain of the kind of antenna shape. This is really a forward design. Uh, procedure. Um, it'd be very interesting to learn how to do inverse design uh, in with um, uh, with radio frequency figures of merit. That would be really cool. Uh, so that's that's something that we should add to the to-do list, actually. Uh, and then we generate, we just write a little Python code that generates the vertices of our antenna shapes, get them into K layout, save as a GDS2, uh, follow the very useful GDS2 import uh, example in the MEEP documentation, uh, so get that import done, run the sim, uh, and then from K layout, uh, we can also get an STL file. So this is what that kind of looks like. Uh, my students writing uh, Python code in the upper uh, upper figure produces the vertices. Those can be then exported into K layout um, to, gen to generate the uh, the GDS2. And then if you do the right do the importation the right way, uh, you know, you can build all the little shapes and then you can use something called Maya VI, which is included with MEEP if you install it with Conda, uh, to visualize the three-dimensional antenna. And that's that's what we want. That's the antenna that we need. And so you can simulate this CAD design three-dimensional antenna and you get the right E and H plane. So I've got the the E plane at, at a half a gigahertz and five gigahertz for the three-dimensional horn antenna with CAD design. Uh, on the upper blue figures, the radiation patterns, lower figures are the H planes, uh, which happen to be radiant theta equals 90 is the forward direction there. Uh, and then, yeah, those are also at half a gigahertz and five gigahertz with CAD. So that's really useful. This is like an N equals one phase array, just a single element and it has its own radiation pattern. And also these are, given what I know about horns and other kinds of antennas, these are what I would expect uh, for the, the results. This is the example I found extremely helpful uh, to learn how to do this in MEEP. So thank you for that. Um, we want to also simulate the efficiency of the antenna. And there's a, a, a lovely parameter that, pe that people pronounce visuar, uh, but it's the voltage standing wave ratio. So antenna engineers almost always talk about visuar in decibels, and it's like very jargony. Uh, so basically, uh, it's just a ratio of the reflected wave. If you send a pulse down, like not all of the energy gets radiated. Some of it just goes back up the the coax cable that you tried to, to connect to the antenna. And so the ratio of the reflected uh, wave magnitude to the, the, the forward wave magnitude is called, the, we just uh, you know associate that with a complex reflection coefficient. Uh, but you can rearrange that into something called the visuar, which illustrates the bandwidth very clearly. Um, so equation eight shows the, the VSWR, um, and it's one plus the magnitude of gamma minus, uh, over one minus the magnitude of gamma. So if that's infinity, you've got you know, a, a, not, an antenna that's not radiating anything at all. Um, and if it's if it's close to one, you've got a good efficient antenna. And so here you can see that the bandwidth of the horn uh, is uh, is between about a half a gigahertz and six gigahertz before the VSWR um, skyrockets. Um, and I do this in two dimensions in MEEP with the usual setup, but I add a co what I'm calling a coaxial cable, Gaussian source all the way down past a flux monitor, through the out out through the horn through the near to far projection uh, surfaces, and so you get both the VSWR uh, and the radiation pattern from that calculation like that. Uh, with the time I have left, just the you know we're we're now just now this week uh, you know restarting our 3D printing effort. Um, as you can imagine, that was very difficult during lockdown. But now that we're back in back in business, we are using open source tools to uh, get these designs into the 3D printer. And, and what you see in the upper left there is, uh, is my student running the, the horn on Blender, which is an open source uh, CAD tool. Uh, and we can you know, save STL files, feed them into the printer. And the, the white horn you see at the right in my lab is uh, uh, just with pure plastic, just as a test run. We thought we had a conductive uh, 3D printer filament 
uh, in the black, that's called protopasta from a company called Ninja Tech. Turns out its resistivity is about four orders of magnitude uh, higher than the latest, most recent one uh, that we found called Electrify from a company called Multi 3D LLC. And so um, there is actually a growing body of research where people use stuff like this for like the Electrify filament to actually 3D print their their antennas. Uh, and that's going to be a huge advantage for the RF field because uh, the, the normally the way you make an antenna, it's really, I mean, you have to pay a lot of money to get a really precisely machined metal antenna uh, when the 3D printing resolution is just as good, but you can just have one in your, your office printing the antenna for you. So um, these are all references that I found just from the company Multi3D, where they're, they're pointing out, they're proud of how different scientists, scientific groups have used their product, but this, this is not an exhaustive list. Also, I did want to mention that meat parallelism does accelerate this process. So uh, this is a plot that I generated this week to, to try to figure out just how my 128-core um, uh, desktop here can actually speed up the process. Uh, and it turns out that most of the acceleration comes from the set epsilon function. So if I add cores to that um, in an object like, uh, like this, um, setting it up is most of the acceleration and then running it and doing the near to far field projection um, there's some acceleration but it's not it's not as much as the uh, what you get from the uh, set epsilon so um, I think that might be 45 minutes let's see so let me just say thank you to my these are all undergraduate students that work with me and then and uh, Sean is my lab tech so so Adam Ray and Dane are my students and Sean uh, was uh, uh, very helpful in getting the 3D pr printer fixed and up and running. Uh, I talked about how we got here, microns to centimeters, what's a phased array, how do we apply it to things like Ice Cube Gen 2 and the Office of Naval Research, uh, radar design, um, how we're actually using MEEP to create real antennas and closing the loop to create a fully open source uh, design system for RF antennas. Uh, and just thank you. Thank you for your attention and the invitation. I appreciate it. So thank you, Jordan. Let, let me begin by saying welcome to the club. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, we uh, the theorists we like to say that Maxwell's equations are scale invariant. So it's the same physics if you multiply all the dimensions by a, a thousand and all the wavelengths yeah. by a thousand. Uh, although sometimes the terminology changes. So for example, what you were calling grading lobes, or essentially what Art of M was calling diffraction orders. Yep. in this tutorial uh, yesterday when the wavelength becomes small compared to the period. The, the big caveat, of course, is that as you change uh, wavelengths, the materials uh, yeah, the uh, change quite a bit. Something has and, to go wrong at 10 to the fourth, <laughs> 10 four orders and, of magnitude. And, and, and so, it, you know, at, at, at RF, you have near perfect conductors, uh, whereas we don't have that at optical frequencies. And so the, the, that's one area of MEEP that certainly hasn't uh, it had as much attention as some of the other areas of modeling of metal uh, structures and, and good conductors. So there's a lot of tricks that potentially you could use. And the, the big concern I would always have about modeling RF in MEEP or in any FTTD code is, is the, you know, the, the resolution that you might need. I, I, know you, I noticed you were using 70 pixels per wavelength, which is relatively high resolution. I, I don't know if you could say something about the, the convergence you, you observed and and the resolution yeah. requirements. Yeah, let's go back to the uh, the field picture. Um, I like this picture because it it showed the engineer at the Navy um, whom I was teaching about RF uh, phased arrays, just how quickly uh, the wavefront forms in front of the antennas. And I was thinking, you know, it's got to be farther in front of the, there, I mean, I think in terms of near to f near region and far field region. Um, but mostly I just pit, put the, the, resol the resolution uh, that controlled the runtime, and as long as I got the figure at right, I really didn't ask too many questions, you know. So I, um, so I guess, uh, yeah. So I, I picked resolution six. Uh, Ten is is kind of the highest I I tend to go, um, but yeah, it's only because I'm looking at a certain way of of characterizing the power versus angle. But if I needed for example, one of the things that's really important in, in ultra high energy neutrino detection is we have a very specific, I have a paper out this year with a very specific prediction for what the time domain structure of the signal would look like. And it's about, it's like maybe one nanosecond wide. It's a Gaussian pulse, with one nanosecond width. And so for that, if I want nanosecond resolution on my, if I was to use MEEP to read out the, the time domain 
uh, uh, shape of the E field uh, in my detector, that's that's probably the thing that would drive the resolution. But but for now, I just put a resolution that gives me the right radiation pattern. And I was also wondering if um, you know what resolution would I need to get uh, the the visuar correct. And and since again, I I, I tended I, since I got something close to one, I didn't ask too many questions about the resolution. But I think um, it's probably worthwhile to at least rerun the the visuar calculation at like several different. Um, uh, you know, like like versus like what's the what's the visuar at two gigahertz versus resolution, just to make sure uh, that it's that's proper prediction. So I actually haven't done that yet, but that's a relatively easy thing to do. I mean, the thing that usually limits the resolution is the resolving the the geometry and the structures. Everything else, there's usually even if you want very high time resolution or something else uh, in the solutions, there's usually tricks uh, to to get that if it's if. If, if you don't need the resolution to actually resolve the structure. The, the danger that you might run into is that a lot of the, 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 the qualitative features of the radiation pattern are gonna be set by the, you know, the, the periodicity of the structure and it's kind of gross features. And so yeah. even if it's not resolving the fine details of the antennas, it, you know, it'll have more or less the expected radiation pattern, but it won't, you know, if, if you look at the details, if, if, if it's not really resolving the details of the antenna, it might not be quantitatively correct in some of the, the you know, the amplitude of the power and things. Yeah, so that's, that's, are there other well questions? Uh, uh, sorry. If you... Oh, I was gonna say, yeah. So for equation one, I'm trying to keep the wavelength much more on the scale of the macro uh, features and the the back lobes and all that stuff is due to the little micro features that I, we're just kind of hoping like our, they're like the boogeyman, we just pretend they're not there. <laughs> Other other questions, Ryan? Hi, Jordan. Really nice talk. Um, coming from an undergraduate, primarily undergraduate college, and having learned MEEP yourself recently, I wondered if you you had any opinions about using MEEP in your your classes, your education, to teach you know Ooh. electromagnetics of some kind, and whether what 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 would it take to adapt to do something like that? Yeah. So that is. Well, I okay, guess so I'll say I'll say two things. Um, I am the person who teaches our upper division uh, electromagnetic theory class, uh, and I've taught it now twice. But one was during lockdown; it was very abnormal, abnormally taught. It was taught in like seven-week modules. So uh, let's pretend that never happened. Um, that would be really hard to do anything except, you know, Maxwell's equation one, solve it. Maxwell's equation two, solve it. But then once I finally got in the classroom in the full semester, um, you know, I decided that. Although I wanted to include MEEP, um, I, I felt that the students, like they needed kind of the very most basic regular uh, thing before we started asking them to do a bunch of Python since they were all rusty about that. Um, but what we did do um, is we have, instead of in lieu of a final exam, I typically have a summative project, like a final project where they do some research, a literature search, a computation or a solving a really hard problem from the book. And for some of them, I encourage them to to learn what is MEEP, uh, and I would I would sit with them and kind of do a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing with them, and then and we would present that at the the end of the class. Um, but but I think it's actually a better idea, like going forward now that I've gained some experience teaching that course, to just build MEEP into the content. Like if I have lecture notes, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is Jupyter Notebooks. So like if my lecture slides and my course content are already on my content management system and I have uh, you know, my, my lecture slides and my quizzes and stuff there, um, why not have the Jupyter Notebooks you know, right alongside? Uh, we use happen to use Moodle. I don't know what people use at their institution, whether it's like Blackboard or other, the other ones. But if on if on Moodle I have a Python or a, a Jupyter notebook, um, this can run in the browser, and so they shouldn't need to install anything in uh, on their own laptop. And I find actually that's one of the the, the main bottlenecks with un getting undergrads to understand computational physics is install getting a situation where they can just run the the code on whatever laptop they have. Um, sometimes they'll use like Spider, or sometimes they'll use some other one where it's a fully integrated IDE for Python or something, um, and it's slow, and it just slows down their win their old Windows laptop. Whereas if you're doing it on a browser, theoretically, anybody should be able to do that. So I have done Jupyter Notebooks in my computer logic and digital design course. So I teach one about like 
uh, digital circuits, Boolean algebra, binary number systems, simple logic circuits, much more complex logic circuits. And we do all of that in, in Jupyter uh, because there's a really nice, uh, since I'm on my browser, um, everyone should know what this is. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's a way to teach uh, students firmware, uh, but they don't have to know Verilog, they don't have to know VHDL, they can just learn it in Python. Um, so this is a system where you can teach them how to you know, control digital circuits with Jupyter Notebooks on their laptop. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and so since I already know how to do that one course, I would probably just do that in electromagnetic theory. So I also posted a link to chat. So when, I, so when I've used MEEP for te in teaching at MIT, I exactly use Jupyter Notebooks and I have them run it in the cloud on Binder. And there's a link there that has the Binder environment. You just click the link and it spins up in the cloud and then you can run MEEP. I mean, it's not, they, they don't give you a lot of compute resources, but for running little toy 2D, 2D calculations, it's, it's not bad. And then you, you sort of give them 80, 80 or 90% of the code and have them fill in a few parameters and, you know, in their initial runs. Uh, 